Broadcasting to the world, this is On Call with Chad McCall. With Chad McCall. In our show, we bring you inspiration, strategies, and insights on how to start, grow, and scale your business. It's drastically changed my life. The show is so informative, I just love it. It's honest. It's helped me grow as a person. Real talk about life, lifestyle, society, and living limitless. Learning from the top influencers across the world, along with industry experts, authorities for you to live your greatest life. It's time to level up. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Here's your host, best selling author and mentor, Chad McCall. Welcome, welcome to a powerful episode of On Call with Chad McCall. Today's call is to the most decorated American I have ever had a chance to speak with. I'll be calling retired Major General for over 30 years, West Point grad, Ranger, Airborne, multiple combat tours, spent 20 years for the Department of Defense and Anti-Drug, Counter-Narcotics, and Terrorism Task Force, the last 10 years as a military analyst. He holds lectures now on national security, strategic planning, and any type of threats against America. And finally, he is one hell of an American. I'm going to talk about how did this coronavirus happen and are there any additional threats right now? And I'm going to have him explain what is this thing we keep hearing called the deep state. Let's just see where the conversation goes. Hello, Siri. Hello, Chad. Will you give Major General Paul Vallely a call? Of course, I'd love to call General Paul Vallely. Hello, Chad. How are you? I'm doing great, Paul. How are you, sir? Well, I'm fine. It's a beautiful day here in Montana. A lot of snow in the mountains, but uh, it's in the valleys. It's beautiful, just like a beautiful spring day. Anyhow, we're taking advantage of that as they start opening up businesses uh, around Montana uh, today and uh, following on with more opening up next week. I'm going to catch you before you go out there and hit the golf course and ask you some questions. Let's get going right into this and let's talk about this coronavirus. Where did it come from? Well, we've identified it through multiple sources, uh, including a Chinese group that I work with out of San Francisco that uh, have their tentacles deep inside of China with their uh, network uh, So we've been able to validate a lot of things about the Wuhan uh, laboratory uh, in Wuhan, China, where we know now that it did emanate from, uh, and it was a uh, a clinically designed uh, virus uh, there uh, that they uh, have been working with, and a number of other viruses at Wuhan. But what happened, we're not sure yet whether it was accidentally uh, passed on from members of the laboratory there into the Wuhan population, uh, or whether it was intentionally weaponized by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, whatever, we don't know for sure, but through our investigations, hopefully that truth will come out. But it did spread, and instead of reporting the deadly outbreak in Wuhan when it first appeared, the Chinese Communist Party engaged in a massive cover-up, intimidating uh, some very brave Chinese whistleblowers, like the late Dr. Li Wenliang, by destroying samples that pointed to the virus's origin and shutting down a laboratory that shared the virus's genetic sequence on the internet. By the time the Chinese Communist Party switched from cover-up to containment, it was already too late for the Chinese people in the world. At the time, just before the outbreak, there was a festival, is that right? And the Lunar Festival, which was between uh, January 10th and February the 18th, How many flights are we talking about to and from the festival? Thousands of flights, thousands of Chinese flying all over the world, particularly into Europe and uh, United States uh, and and other areas that got infected. For example, Milan had over 100,000 Chinese working in their garment luxury uh, uh, manufacturing plants there. And so there were a lot of flights going in and out of Italy. So we've tracked all of that. Uh, that's, That's where it started. We know that for sure now. You mentioning that Lunar Festival happening around that same time, it's how many coincidences do you have to have before it's not a coincidence anymore? Well, that's right. And as you connect the dots in China, the headquarters for the Chinese Communist Party and the the political apparatus in China is out of Beijing. 
Beijing had very few cases. Now you go down to Shanghai, another multi-million population center down there is the, is the center of the finances and business for China. Very low density of any kind of uh, infectious uh, um, populated area there. So uh, we know for sure uh, that they also were creating a vaccine at the same time in the Wuhan laboratory and that's why they kept that to themselves and probably used it in Beijing or Shanghai and other parts of China, and they would not share it with the rest of the world. So what we have here is a situation where we've got to continue to uh, fight this virus, uh, open up our businesses, but at the same time, uh, there's got to be a retribution against the Chinese Communist Party for what, they, for what they've done. We have prepared a proposal to the president, which we sent him on uh, Monday, which outlines all of the retribution that can be conducted against China, short of going to war with them, a fighting type of war. Most of this is in finances and banking and trade and so on. I'm not sure whether I've shared that with you yet, but I'll be happy to send you that report. Oh yeah, that'd be great. I think a lot of the listeners would love to see that. You mentioned something that really stood out there, Paul. The financial sector and the political sector really weren't affected very much. Where Wuhan, cases were going crazy. They were still allowing flights out of there. But I remember the protests were somewhere along the lines in there too. And then all of a sudden those stopped. Right. Any correlation between the two, the protests, the virus and all that? Well, sure. I think they're all interconnected. But once it got out in Wuhan, I think the Chinese uh, apparatus, the political uh, leaders there uh, almost became... uh, well, I, I would say the atmosphere and environment came very, became very chaotic. And so with that, as I said, they, they determined the Chinese Communist Party to cover it up for almost three weeks. At the same time, they were treating their own people uh, in China. When you look at what has to be done, we've got to conduct some kind of a retribution against China because you cannot allow a nation to uh, affect the entire planet and bring down economies and businesses and the killing of uh, thousands and thousands of people. Do we really know the total death number over there in China? Because I've heard numbers from tens of thousands, but then I've heard hundreds of thousands of deaths really happened over there. Do you when, do we know anything about that? We do not have a count on that. Uh, I'm sure that they'll keep the numbers low. Uh, they, they deal in deceit and deception. And so uh, whether we'll ever find out the total amount of Chinese that have been... Uh, have died because of the virus. We may not know that. What about the WHO? Because there's been so much going on and everybody seems to be standing behind the WHO other than us. We're like, hey, something happened here. Why Why is everybody on their side against us? Well, it's the United Nations typically. They're part of that, the WHO. We know the head of the WHO is a, is a Chinese sympathizer. Uh, we know that Bill Gates was also involved with the Wuhan laboratory with uh, contributions and donations there. And guess who came out to support the WHO? Bill Gates and others. And so from that standpoint, the president was right uh, in denying any more funding to the WHO. Uh, President Trump's uh, motivation is to give that money directly uh, to countries or people that need it, uh, rather than funneling it through a very corrupt organization in the United Nations called the WHO. Well, then we have a lot of things going on with the virus. What about the other threat? Well, we hear the word storm. I look at that as there's just a ton of things happening in the world globally, right? It's all happened to be right now that we're facing these things the last few months. What about the other things that are going on that we're combating? Iran, maybe? or Are we prepared for other things just in case? Well, we're better prepared today than we were, say, a month or two ago. I can tell you in our threat analysis... Uh, When the United States is vulnerable, guess what happens? Our adversaries take advantage of that, uh, such as the Chinese, such as the Iranians, uh, such as the cartels, uh, the five or six cartels in the Sinaloa area of Mexico. Um, But you can take uh, even to a slight degree, maybe Russia. We just had uh, Iran uh, launch a, a new satellite. And what Iran and China are working on is a EMP uh, electromagnetic pulse bomb that can be uh, launched from a satellite, which basically deadens all our computers. It's a low yield nuclear uh, explosion. 
And we know our electrical grid system is very vulnerable right now and hasn't been fixed yet. And those that entire electrical grid is run up, run by computer. If uh, an EMP attack occurs, it could deaden all the computers. That means airplanes fall out of the sky. Your cars don't work because they got chips in them now, right? Our military uh, is very aware uh, of these threats. Uh, we're prepared. We've moved uh, more ships into the South Atlantic fleet off of Mexico and Venezuela. We've also targeted, uh, but have not uh, launched anything yet against the cartels, and that must be done because they're tied to China uh, in many different ways with sex trafficking and also providing a, a tremendous amount of fentanyl and other drugs uh, into the United States uh, uh, as they think, of course, we're in a weakened capacity right now. At least that's what they think. We're not as weak as they may think we are. We're actually stronger right now than we were one or two months ago. So you have uh, the cartels even flying uh, some of their agents and money into Canada. And we've seen almost a double uh, amount of people crossing the eastern border of Canada into the North New York area. But you have things going on in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia too. You have uh, the drugs going through, you have a big Chinese population up in the Vancouver, but a lot of Americans don't look to Canada. They're in very bad shape up there. And that's a, that's a threat on our borders. So uh, if you look at that, uh, like any threat, you have to analyze it, and then you have to be prepared to neutralize that threat. What you're saying is thing I didn't even think about. I know a lot of listeners didn't think about it. By China being connected with the cartel, there's other threats other than a virus. Uh, but again, we're better prepared today and tomorrow, and that's what's important. I mean, it's always so negative. Well, the fake news, they live in a, uh, an environment of negativity attacking uh, President Trump, no matter what he does positively. Same thing with the Socialist Democrats and even some of the rhinos we have, like Mitt Romney. You know, he's fighting the battle every day, but he's out there on the front lines, and uh, he uh, he's doing a good job with his team. He's had to uh, update his team, I guess, in the last week to some degree with some new people. But they're on top of it. Uh, our military's on top of it. I think from that standpoint, we've got to ensure we don't take the negativity of, of the media, the vast majority of the media and papers, and uh, listen to them because uh, they're opinion people right now. They're not news anchors. They're not hosts. Uh, they're really opinion people on their, and, you know, if you just listen to some of the uh, uh, interviews on CNN or MSNBC, these people are all opinion oriented, and that's not their job. And that's one of the biggest problems with the media today. We don't have a lot of professional investigative reporters anymore. They feed off the internet. They feed off of emails they get from other people in the liberal media. And uh, you can you can tell at the press conferences uh, how naive they are and uh, how inexperienced they are as a, as a uh, investigative reporter because they can't answer a lot of the questions. But that's the state of affairs. We've got to get beyond it. Plus, the other threat... Uh, dysfunctional Congress. I'm not sure what we're going to do about the Congress in the future. We, we probably need a convention of states. We've got to have term limits, but we cannot go on uh, with a dysfunctional House of Representatives and Senate as we have right now. They're not benefiting the people. And, uh, you know, we're spending trillions and trillions of dollars out of the Treasury to uh, counter uh, the COVID-19 right now. But uh, that's another threat. The other threat is on our universities with all the liberalism and socialism that's taught to our students. 19 out of 20 professors uh, at most of these universities are uh, left-wing uh, socialists and our students are getting indoctrinated within 90 days. You send them in as a freshman, they come back home in 90 days and they're talking stuff that the mothers and fathers say, why, where'd you learn that at? Well, that's what's happening on our universities and that's a threat as well. A lot of people don't think about that when you leave the confines of your home and you go to think you're expanding your knowledge and it's almost like a brainwash is what you're saying. It is. Yeah. Charlie Kirk, who's on 200 and some campuses from Turning Point USA, he's identified that very, very clearly of the indoctrination that goes on in the freshman year. Wow. Now this lockdown and going on quarantine here in the States, closing borders, it, we still have other things going on out there, other operations that I know you know, some you probably can talk about, some you can't, but you were 
heavily involved in the narcotics and drug task force. How's our battle against drugs during a lockdown last? Does it help us? Does it hurt us? Well, they're continuing to build the wall on our southern border. We have military down there. where We're much stronger on the border than we've ever been. The cartels, they, they figure out a way. You know, they found a tunnel just about three weeks ago going into Arizona. So the cartels are very busy. Now, the other thing we found out, uh, the cartels have funded certain uh, members of the population in the United States in California. And I think it was either Fresno or Stockton, a very wealthy uh, Mexican living there. He actually uh, was funneling funds into the socialist democratic leaders in California in their campaigns. So the tentacles of the cartels, not only in sex trafficking, uh, child uh, um, kidnappings and all of that thing, drugs, but they're also influencing our leaders, particularly in the sanctuary city areas as well. I think we're waiting. That's going to be something that's going to pop out here this year, I bet. I think so, along with what Soros has done. That brings up the next point, George Soros. Tell the listeners. Some people don't know George Soros. He's not just a household name. Some people do that start looking and digging into this. Give us a little bit of background of him, his purpose, and what he's doing and why he's such a problem. Well, he does everything to undermine uh, the United States. He's a globalist uh, for, for sure. Um, he's, a, he's a very nasty, evil individual. He lives just north of New York City, by the way. But he has funds to fund Antifa. He even funded a lot of the organizations uh, that were supporting the migration from Central and South America, Mexico, into the United States when we had the whole of the uh, refugee rush last year. But what was interesting, as we tracked in 2015, Soros funded an organization called Stand Up America. And we found out that was the counter arm foundation, Stand Up America U.S., and uh, from that standpoint, we've been burying them every day. They can't compete with us because of our support, even with the money they've been throwing in. So if anybody Googles Stand Up America, they'll get that source organization. <clears throat> but it shouldn't be confused with our organization, which is Stand Up America uh, U.S. Foundation. Our website, by the way, is standupamericaus.org. And uh, you can see our postings there every morning and we have three social media sites as well and so with george soros funding and doing a lot of these things amongst other people you have a great explanation of what's called the deep state that's where i was going next is explain to some of the listeners that are completely new to this what is the deep state when that's said well when i was in the defense department we used to call it the bureaucracy the gigantic bureaucracy uh the, uh, that permeated all through government, the national level, the state level, and even, even the county. But uh, the article we wrote uh, uh, last year on the deep state really categorizes the deep state into four levels in the swamp there. These are the political politicians that are elected to office or appointed to like being secretary of uh, education or secretary, undersecretaries in the defense department, uh, and uh, all throughout the executive branch. So those are political appointees. So that's the first level. And under Obama, a tremendous amount of left-wing socialist appointees were made by the Obama administration. And some of those, and many of those were carried on even after Trump took over. The second level down is what we call the SES. S -E -S. This, this is the senior executive service. These are your highest ranking uh, government uh, bureaucrats uh, what we call the SES uh, executive level. These are GS-17, GS-18 type of positions. And they control a lot right underneath the political appointees. The third level down then are your, your basically your managers uh, within the different uh, organizations in government. They, they manage the different offices. Uh, they have people underneath them. And then the fourth level down really are your staffers that work for the managers or then work for the SES uh, senior executive, and they worked for the politicians, and it all filters down. And that permeated uh, all from uh, even go back at Clinton, even some of the left wing people Bush put in. And then, of course, it was exacerbated uh, by the Obama administration. I mean, it's almost so deep rooted <laughs> to get to bust that up. I mean, if there's issues in there, how do you uncover the problem? It's so thick. 
Oh yeah. Well, you identify him. Yeah, you identify him. And uh, the, the biggest mistake President Trump made at the beginning was not replacing all of that level one uh, political leaders that were in our political appointees that were, that were throughout all the uh, organizations in the executive branch. But he had to learn uh, about the deep state and he's still uh, unfolding and uncovering many of them. Uh, many positions aren't being filled uh, right now intentionally because first of all, we don't need them all in government. We need a smaller government. And so he's uncovering more and more. And some of the biggest violators as we've seen is in the uh, Department of Justice and the FBI, the CIA, the State Department, and all of those uh, who have been fighting Trump right from the beginning. That's how it happened. Wow. That's a great explanation. Thanks for doing it. What are your thoughts on the whole entire election going to mail-in voting? Is that even going to happen? You know, I, I've been doing absentee voting for a long time, but, you know, we're registered in our county, uh, and then we have to validate it and sign it sec back. But this uh, mail-in voting, you'll have uh, in the precincts out there, uh, the, the ballots ba basically that they can pick up rather than having validated by being registered. And so that can be counterfeited and passed on to a lot of people and then they mail it in. <clears throat> so we do not want to see that. And of course, the Democratic Socialists want this very much so they can get illegals, they can get other people uh, voting, even a lot of people that are deceased. <laughs> They still haven't uncovered all of those yet uh, in, in the roles throughout the United States. So uh, we have to be very guarded how they do mail-in voting, but it can't be as the Democrats are pushing. The trafficking that's been going on, 800,000 children a year to sex trafficking. And we've had a lot of busts and arrests and things, but it's not as broadcast as it should be. And I know that you have been in that world for 20 years. Tell us why we don't hear so much about it. Why is it so quiet? Yeah, ask the media that. Yeah, ask the media that. The information's there, but they certainly don't cover it. Every once in a while, you'll see something that's published. Uh, but certainly, uh, this, uh, this media that we have today, uh, other than Laura Logan, who went down there, by the way, she's with Fox now, but uh, she went down and... Uh, did a very good peace documentary uh, on our southern border. But uh, a lot of the feedback I get from Canada, the trafficking that's come up through British Columbia has been unbelievable. And they found, it's called the Pig's Ranch. You can Google it up there. But they found 28 young women murdered and buried on this uh, Pig's Ranch uh, outside of Vancouver. And the Royal Canadian Mounted Police covered it up. And, and there's been a big sex trafficking ring uh, in Europe, by the way, that came out of the Ukraine and uh, other uh, countries over there. Uh, I can remember being in Paris a couple times over the last few years. And the amount of uh, young girls that were on the Champs Elysees, uh, they were fed in there basically for prostitution and for pickpocketing and so on. So these rings have come out of East European countries into the United States, into New Jersey, uh, particularly, but also uh, from some of the Arab countries in, in the Middle East have been involved in it as well. So it's a global uh, uh, situation there with this sex trafficking, particularly of young women. And many of these young women have disappeared completely. The kids would bring everyone together, regardless of what political party, because that's kind of one of those, you draw the line in the sand when it comes to kids, you'd think, where if they start promoting it, then they'd say, oh, well, we're not, you know, we're choosing neutral ground instead of picking a side if we start talking about the kids. And it's almost like they want to keep it quiet. That's unfortunate. Yeah, that's correct. Well, the thing about it is, is the awareness of it. It's pushed back where we don't hear about it like we should. Like, what's the purpose of the bases in like, Colorado or Pennsylvania, like what did they? What purpose do they serve? Well, they're primarily what we call continuity of uh, government. Okay, so if something happens in our government in Washington, the politicians uh, can move to uh, certain bunkers. One of them is in Pennsylvania, but for the military, NORAD in Colorado Springs have been around a long time, and that's a fully. Uh, a fully operational command center there tracking satellites. They even tracked a lot of the drug uh, drug uh, routes coming in and out of the United States. 
airplane. And so a lot of our senior military uh, during the COVID-19 had moved out to the bunker out there in, in uh, NORAD. Uh, that's basically North American defense. And they have a four-star general out there that's in charge of that. But it has to do with anything happening uh, to weaken our government. Uh, for example, the president goes up in Air Force One, politicians go to this bunker, senior military move out of the Pentagon, move to NORAD and some other installations. And that's all to make sure we have a continuation of our government that doesn't completely buckle. And it's just more of a preparation, not saying, hey, just because people are going in there in Colorado that we're preparing for something major to happen. No, it's more being prepared for what, what the current situation is and being able to react to it, again, on, on certain threats uh, that the Air Force, our Navy, Marines, Army can react to uh, in case uh, there is a uh, some kind of an attack against the United States. Here's one about the Iran situation with the boats. What is that situation about? What is your thoughts? Well, you remember under Obama, we had uh, those boats out there uh, the Iranians have gone to a lot of small, small boat uh, fleets out there that uh, they can rapidly move around the water. They're, they're manned with guns and uh, some of them with rockets. Uh, and so this latest, if you saw the, uh, the boats out there, they look like sport fishing boats with a 50 caliber machine gun on the front of them. Yeah. And so President Trump will not follow in the footsteps of Obama by appeasing the Iranians. So he's put it out there. He said, you attack any of our fleets or harass them anymore, we're going to blow you out of the water. And it will happen. We do. Well, I think that might be happening here uh, sooner than we think, right? <laughs> yeah, it could. Yeah. It depends what, uh, how aggressive these Iranians want to be. Now, uh, last question for you, and, I, and I've kept you on here way longer than I was uh, planning on it, but you had a good talk about a reset. Um, explain what you mean by you think the economy is doing a bit of a reset right now. Well, I think our, we're going to reset how we do business, particularly in banking and finances. Uh, we're going to audit any Chinese companies uh, that are doing business in the United States finally, which we should have been doing before. You know, I would like to see us do away with the Federal Reserve and put the responsibilities for our money back in the Treasury Department where it should be. Uh, resetting how the CIA operates. Uh, if I'm for one, I would close down the CIA on Friday and open it up on Monday and have a new structure, organization, and mission. Get back uh, leveling out with good human intelligence around the world. So there's a lot of resets that I see. You know, in the global financial market, even in the medical pharmaceutical area, you're going to see a whole reset there. How we develop new vaccines and with what rapidity we can uh, develop them and then have them available to the population. So we're resetting uh, again our military to make sure we're prepared for the future too each day. So those are a lot of resets I see coming. Paul, I know you have access to classified information and things run across your desk all the time. What is top priority right now in your expert opinion as a threat to the United States? Yeah, it's really the cyber attacks into our computer system, our operational system, which is a big threat. Dr. Peter Pry, by the way, P-R-Y, you should Google him and your audience and read all the studies and analysis that he has done on this uh, EMP uh, threat. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. He really lays it out quite clearly. And I'll make sure I post his information, you know, a link for him. I'll do the research on that. And as well. So how can people um, follow you and get more connected with you? Is the best way through your website, Facebook? Tell the listeners how they can connect with you and what you're doing in your foundation, Paul. Well, we have three Facebook sites. And the reason we use Facebook is we can reach outside of the United States very quickly into Europe and other parts uh, of the world. We have uh, Paul Vallely, the General's Group. We have the Legacy National Security Advisory Group. And then we have just my name, Paul Vallely. Our website is standupamericaus.org. And so those are the best ways to communicate with us. And if you want to sign up for our, our newsletter, just send us an email and we'll get you on the newsletter list. And we also like donations and support monetarily of what we're doing. Uh, that helps us uh, continue on with the important uh, projects uh, that we have uh, for 2020 and 21. So I'll make sure everyone has the contact information, can do that and support your guys' journeys uh, 
from now forward. And before I let you go, I always have someone answer a question that no one would know from a bio or a website or anything about you, Paul, just to get to know you a little bit better. What was your pet's name? Yeah, yeah we're lab people. <laughs> Nemo. Pinch Nemo. Nemo. That's a good one. Lab, my wife lost her chocolate lab, Kuma. I think he was about 14 years old. So when you say lab, that's a, my wife will listen to this and she'll be like, oh my gosh, we love labs. All right. Last question. One more. What is your favorite movie, Paul? Uh, Patton. Patton. Wow. That was 1970, I believe. And that is before I was even born, but I have seen Patton. It's a great movie. Yeah, I could definitely see you liking Patton. Love that. Anything. Yeah. Love it. Well, uh, I want to say thank you uh, today for taking the time out before golf. I know, but it make you late for your tea time. I appreciate your answers to your questions, your insight. I appreciate your service to our country. I mean, I just, I applaud you. My hat's off to you, your foundation and everything you're doing for us here in America, keeping us safe. Keep up the good work. I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Chad. We'll do it again, hopefully. Huh? All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care, Paul. Okay. I really enjoyed this call today, and I hope you enjoyed it as well with Paul Vallelie. There are many things going on all over the world, people risking their lives, fighting the fights, oftentimes against invisible enemies. Please don't forget to give thanks and appreciation to all of those amazing men and women in any uniform that go out there each day and keep us safe, our military, our police, especially in times like right now, our healthcare workers fighting to keep us healthy. Thank you all. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, and remember, friends, you are always on call.